At the same time, Great Britain moved 11,000 troops into Canada and positioned them menacingly along America's northern border. The British fleet went to war alert should their quick intervention be called for. Lincoln knew he was in a double bind. That's why he agonized over the fate of the Union. There was a lot more to it than just differences between the North and the South. That's why his emphasis was always on Union and not merely the defeat of the South. But Lincoln needed money to win. In 1861, Lincoln and his Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, went to New York to apply for the necessary loans. The money changers, anxious to see the Union fail, offered loans at 24 to 36 percent interest. Lincoln said thanks, but no thanks, and returned to Washington. Lincoln sent for an old friend, Colonel Dick Taylor of Chicago, and put him on the problem of financing the war. During one meeting, Lincoln asked Taylor what he discovered. Taylor put it this way. Why, Lincoln, that is easy. Just get Congress to pass a bill authorizing the printing of full legal tender treasury notes and pay your soldiers with them and go ahead and win your war with them also. When Lincoln asked if the people of the United States would accept the notes, Taylor said, the people or anyone else will not have any choice in the matter if you make them full legal tender. They will have the full sanction of the government and be just as good as any money as Congress is given that express right by the Constitution. So that's exactly what Lincoln did. In 1862-63, he printed up $450 million worth of the new bills. In order to distinguish them from other banknotes in circulation, he printed them in green ink on the back side. That's why the notes were called greenbacks. With this new money, Lincoln paid the troops and bought their supplies. During the course of the war, nearly $450 million worth of greenbacks were printed at no interest to the federal government. Lincoln understood who was really pulling the strings and what was at stake for the American people. This is how he explained his rationale. The government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency and credit needed to satisfy the spending power of the government and the buying power of consumers. The privilege of creating and issuing money is not only the supreme prerogative of government, but it is the government's greatest creative opportunity. By the adoption of these principles, the taxpayers will be saved immense sums of interest. Money will cease to be master and become the servant of humanity. A truly incredible editorial in the London Times explained the central banker's attitude towards Lincoln's greenbacks. If this mischievous financial policy, which has its origins in North America, shall become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce, it will become prosperous without precedent in the history of the world. The brains and wealth of all countries will go to North America. That country must be destroyed, or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. The scheme was effective, so effective that the next year, 1863, with federal and Confederate troops beginning to mass for the decisive battle of the Civil War, and the Treasury in need of further congressional authority to issue more greenbacks, Lincoln allowed the bankers to push through the National Bank Act. These new national banks would operate under a virtual tax-free status and collectively had the exclusive monopoly power to create the new form of money, banknotes. Though greenbacks continued to circulate, their numbers were not increased. But most importantly, from this point on, the entire U.S. money supply would be created out of debt by bankers buying U.S. government bonds and issuing them for reserves for banknotes. As historian John Kenneth Galbraith explained it. In numerous years following the war, the federal government ran a heavy surplus. It could not, however, pay off its debt. 
retired securities because to do so meant there would be no bonds to back the national banknotes. To pay off the debt was to destroy the money supply. Later in 1863, Lincoln got some unexpected help from Tsar Alexander II of Russia. The Tsar, like Bismarck in Germany, knew what the international money changers were up to and had steadfastly refused to let them set up a central bank in Russia. If America survived and was able to remain out of their clutches, the Tsar's position would remain secure. If the bankers were successful at dividing America and giving the pieces back to Great Britain and France, both nations under control of their central banks, eventually they would threaten Russia again. So the Tsar gave orders that if either England or France actively intervened and gave aid to the South, Russia would consider such action as a declaration of war. He did the same with part of his Pacific fleet and sent them to port in San Francisco. Lincoln was re-elected the next year, 1864. Had he lived, he would surely have killed the National Bank's money monopoly extracted from him during the war. On November 21st, 1864, he wrote a friend the following. The money power preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. Shortly before Lincoln was murdered, his former Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, bemoaned his role in helping secure the passage of the National Banking Act only one year earlier. My agency in promoting the passage of the National Banking Act was the greatest financial mistake in my life. It has built up a monopoly which affects every interest in the country. On April 14, 1865, 41 days after his second inauguration and just five days after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, lamented the death of Abraham Lincoln. The death of Lincoln was a disaster for Christendom. There was no man in the United States great enough to wear his boots. I fear that foreign bankers, with their craftiness and torturous tricks, will entirely corrupt the exuberant riches of America and use it systematically to corrupt modern civilization. They will not hesitate to plunge the whole of Christendom into wars and chaos in order that the earth should become their inheritance. Bismarck well understood the money changers' plan. Allegations that international bankers were responsible for Lincoln's assassination surfaced in Canada 70 years later in 1934. Gerald G. McGeer, a popular and well-respected Canadian attorney, revealed this stunning charge in a five-hour speech before the Canadian House of Commons, blasting Canada's debt-based money system. Remember, it was 1934, the height of the Great Depression, which was ravaging Canada as well. McGeer had obtained evidence deleted from the public record, provided to him by Secret Service agents at the trial of John Wilkes Booth, after Booth's death. McGeer said it showed that Booth was a mercenary working for the international bankers. According to an article in the Vancouver Sun of May 2nd, 1934, Abraham Lincoln, the martyred emancipator of the slaves, was assassinated through the machinations of a group representative of the international bankers who feared the United States president's national credit ambitions. There was only one group in the world at that time who had any reason to desire the death of Lincoln. They were the men opposed to his national currency program and who had fought him throughout the whole Civil War on his policy of greenback currency.